Today I'm going to be turning this Medusa concept art into a 3D model using Blender. And as always, I'm going to do my best to make it look like the reference image, so from any angle, it'll look like a 2D image. This is my first project using my customizable female base mesh. There's a link to it in the description, but this gives me a nice character base to start from. This model already has decent topology and it's fully rigged, so all I need to do is pose it so that it matches the reference. When posing, I always try and line up the body of the character from the shoulders to the hips. If I can get these parts to line up, then I can easily change the size of the head and limbs to match. I always make sure that the model looks good from all angles. It's easy to line it up from the front, but we need to make sure that the side view looks correct as well, and the character also has to look stable. If the character is standing on one leg, like this one, the body has to be angled in a certain way to balance it out, so that's something that I really try and focus on at this stage. Next up, I can use some curves to make the snake. Curves are a special type of object in Blender. They allow you to easily model curved or twisting shapes by only moving a few points. We can then procedurally add thickness and detail to the curve, and at any point we can change these without having to model anything. All we have to move is the point of the curve. I use curves a lot in this project, especially for the hair, but also for some of the jewellery, like the bracelets and the rings around the snake. Pressing Ctrl T allows you to twist the curve, so using the extrude settings and twisting the curve allows you to create taller bands. The snake was made with a bezier curve, but we can also add a curved circle, and from there we can move the curve into place and add the correct thickness. Curves are incredibly useful for complex twisting shapes like these. The sandals were made by duplicating the entire model and then deleting everything except the legs. Then I can subdivide the model to give me some more geometry, and now I can use the mask brush to start marking out the straps as best I can. This is tricky because I also have to think about how the back of the straps will connect. Getting references for this also helps, but it takes a bit of time to make sure that all of the parts connect together and make sense. Once I have the mask in place, I can extract the masked areas which will turn it into its own model. From here, I can adjust the thickness and that will give me a good base for the sandals. Later, I'll come back and clean all of this up, but for now, I just want to get all of the major pieces in place. I repeat the same masking process for the dress, making sure to only mask down to around the belly button, and then when I extract the dress, I can extrude the bottom part to give me the basic shape. At this stage, all I'm doing is getting things in place. I'm not worrying about details or anything specific. Once everything is in place, I can always come back and clean things up, but I need to have this base to work from. Now it's time to tackle the hair. Again, I use curves to make each strand, and it's not too difficult to make the front part of the hair where I can see how the snakes curve, but the more curves we add, the more difficult it becomes, and then when it comes to the back of the hair, it gets tricky because I have to make it up. The main thing I always look for when modeling hair, and the model in general, is that the model has to have shape from all angles. It's very easy to model to make it look good from the front, but from the side, we also want hair strands and parts of the dress that curve to form a nice silhouette. It's not always possible depending on the pose, but keeping a nice flow to the model from all angles will make a better and more appealing model. With the basic hair shape out of the way, I can start adding more detail, starting with the dress. A pleated dress like this is fairly easy to make. All we have to do is make a circle, deselect every second vertex, then scale and rotate the vertices to create this sharp, saw-like shape. And when we extrude this and give it a subdivision modifier, we get some nice pleats. You could use this shape as it is, but I have to match the reference, so I have to move all the points so that they match the flow of the dress. I want the edges and peaks of the folds to match the concept, and sometimes it's difficult to visualize, but something I've been doing lately is using the annotation tool by pressing D and left-clicking to sketch out the shapes. I can then see these annotations on the model, and it allows me to match the shape a lot easier. For the second layer of the dress, I use a basic cylinder and form it around the pleated part of the dress, and then again I use the annotation tool to trace out the shape of the dress, and this gives me a perfect guide. Now I can just do some basic retopology by cutting the shape of the dress forms with the knife tool. I can do this twice, and then that gives me the top layers of the dress. Now we can move on to sculpting to make the folds of the dress. To give me a guide, again I use the annotation tool to trace the concept art. I use my drawing tablet and just use the clay strips or the crease brushes to try and match the folds using the guides. All I do is draw a high spot on one side of the line and put a crease on the other side to create the fold that I'm looking for. Sculpting is not my area of expertise, but I can just smooth out any rough parts and repeat this same process all over the dress, making sure that the folds look somewhat three-dimensional. The next thing to tackle is the face. My customizable base mesh gives me a good base to start from, but now I want it to match the reference by moving things into place. I really like using the annotation tool because it gives me a quick and easy way of visualizing what changes I need to make. With the annotations in place, I can just move the face around in edit mode to try and match the guides. Next up, I want to make more progress with the hair by adding the heads of all the snakes. 
You can do this manually by manipulating each curve to create a head shape, but I think the easier way is to use geometry nodes. Geometry nodes allow us to procedurally model, very similar to curves, but geometry nodes gives us access to much more information about different objects in the scene, and we can then use that information to manipulate the objects. In this case, I've modeled a very simple snake head, and I can find the end point of each of the curves and attach, or as Blender calls it, instance the head at the end of the curve. I can then rotate the head to match the curve direction. We can join the head and body of the snake together, and then we can merge them so that they're all one piece. I can go around the model to slightly twisting and scaling the curves to make sure that the head and body merge together, and you can immediately see it happen. This is one of the incredible things about geometry nodes, is that it's all real time, and when you adjust the curves, you can see the heads of the snakes turn and move correctly. I'm not a geometry nodes expert by any means, but if you know the basics of how points and instancing work, then it can really help you with modeling more repetitive things like this. Now we just need to add a head to the big snake, and that will complete the blockout phase. The base shape of the head starts off as two subdivided cubes, and then I can remesh this and start sculpting to add the details. I have some reference images of snakes on my second monitor, and I keep checking this to make sure that the model looks somewhat accurate. I also only worry about sculpting one side of the head, the side that I can see from the reference image. I can then use the mirror modifier, set it to bisect on the y-axis, which will replace the other side with the sculpted side. With bisect, if it mirrors the wrong side of the model, you can flip that axis, and this will then mirror the other side. After the head of the snake is done, we can start the process of retopology. The body of the snake has 12 vertices on each loop, so I created a circle with 12 vertices and used that as the basis for the head of the snake. Now I know that I can retopologize the head, and as long as there are still 12 vertices at the base of the head, it will connect to the body. Sometimes you might have to make some changes and add some extra geometry, but doing it like this is a good starting point. To keep track of my progress for the retopology, I UV unwrapped each section that I finished and gave it a grid material. I could retopologize everything first and then unwrap, but visually the model wouldn't really change. Because there are so many separate pieces, I just wanted a way of making sure that I completed everything. Unwrapping the big snake gives us distorted UVs because of the curve of the snake. For texturing purposes, it would be much easier if the UVs were straight, that way we could draw straight lines on the texture and they will be wrapped around the body of the snake nicely. There is a very easy way to do this. Find a single face of the UVs that is as close to square or rectangular as possible. You can then select the individual edges and scale them along either the X or Y axis and press 0. This will straighten them. Then with this face selected, if you press L while hovering over the UV island, you'll select it and the face you selected should be a different color. Now if we press U, you can select Follow Active Quads and this will make the rest of the UVs follow the shape and angle of the face we selected. For curved objects like this, that's a really nice and quick way of getting straight UVs. You can also use the new sculpting features within the UV editor to help clean up your UVs. You can use the grab brush to move points around, and pressing shift will then smooth and relax the points. This is useful for quickly adjusting UVs without having to move points individually. There are some UV editing add-ons that make UV unwrapping easier, but it's always good to know how the default Blender tools work. Most of the retopology for this was fairly standard, the only different part for this model were the folds of the dress. I used the sculpted version of the model and decimated it until I had something a bit more simple to work with. Then all I do is use the knife tool and move vertices around until they match the shape of the folds. This looks messy, but if you look at any video game models, you'll see stuff like this for stylized folds. I then just take the model piece by piece, retopologizing and UVing each time. I wouldn't say it's difficult, it's just time consuming. I think the retopology for this took me about 6 hours. For models like this, I always make renders at each stage so that I can look back and see the progress. So you'll see here how the retopologized model slowly comes together piece by piece until we have our final model that's ready to texture. This model is fairly complex, so I need to divide it up into four different UV maps so that I have enough texture space to paint the details. I could put this all on a single 4K texture, but some of the details would be far too small, so I've broken the model up into four sections, the hair, body, dress, and then the snake and jewelry. To make my life a bit easier, I'm going to project the reference image onto the model. We can do this by using a second UV map that is projected from the camera view, and then in texture paint mode, we can use the clone brush to clone the texture from the projected UVs onto the real UVs. From the front view, this projected technique will look pretty good, but as we rotate the model, you can see that it gets quite messy, so we need to clean it up, and for that, I'll be using Substance Painter. Substance Painter allows me to paint the texture onto the model using layers, so it's much easier than using Blender. At the beginning, all I need to worry about is getting all of the colors in place. I'll focus on the details later, but I want to have everything set to the correct color first. 
Once I have all of the base colors finished, I can export the textures and set up some basic materials in Blender. The main reason for doing this is to just get the textures linked to Blender. So now when I do some more texture painting and export the textures, I can reload them and Blender will automatically update. For the diamonds on the dress, I want these to actually be holes, and the way to do this is by using an opacity mask. All we have to do is paint a black and white texture where black will be transparent, allowing us to see through the model. In Substance Painter, I can create an opacity layer, and this will allow me to paint the black and white mask, but you could easily do this in Blender. Now I can use this black and white mask and plug it into a mix shader, and all of the white parts will be the original texture, but the black parts will be transparent. The last part to texture is the big snake, and this took me a few tries to get right. Originally, I tried to match the image exactly, but it was a real struggle to try and make the lines match up on the back of the snake. Then I tried using a procedural diamond texture and used these as guides, but the different UVs weren't lining up correctly. Finally, I opted for the most time-consuming, but most accurate method of drawing squares along the body of the snake following the wireframe. I can then draw diamonds inside each of these squares, which gives us the final texture. This process would have taken so much longer if the UVs were distorted. With nice square UVs, I can just paint straight lines and it then lines up perfectly on the model. In Blender, I can then set up the final materials. To add the shine to the material, we can add a specular BSDF node and again add the shader to RGB and color ramp. If we darken the color of the specular node, we can isolate the highlight. Then again, using another mix node, we can add these highlights on top of our regular tune shader and we have the final material. I can now add the Grease Pencil outlines using the Line Art modifier. We can add the Grease Pencil Collection Line Art object to the scene, and this draws outlines for us. I can just change the size of the lines and add a Noise modifier to give it a bit of randomness. To really sell the sketchy look, I also drew some Grease Pencil sketches and placed these inside the model. We can then use View Layers to render these sketchy lines as a separate render pass, and we can composite them on top of the main render to add the sketchy lines. At the top right, you can create a new View Layer then we can divide our scene up into collections, and we can choose what collections will be visible by what view layer. So the main view layer will show us the model, and the sketchy view layer will only show the grease pencil lines. Then in the compositor, we can simply add these sketchy lines on top of our main render. At this stage, when we render the model, it looks pretty good. However, it still looks a bit fake because of how sharp the grease pencil outlines are. We can fix this with a little bit of compositing. The first thing I'm going to do is sharpen the lines with the filter node set to box sharpen. After this, we can add a blur node and set this to two or three pixels. Now all of our grease pencil outlines should blend with the main image a bit nicer. If the image is too blurry at this stage, you can add another sharpen node after the blur to bring back some details. This is a subtle thing, and when viewing the full image on your phone, you probably won't be able to see it, but I like being able to zoom in to all of my final renders and keep the 2D illusion. If the grease pencil lines were super sharp, it would definitely give away the fact that it's not a drawing. And with that, the final model is done. So let's recap. We started off with the rough model, then retopologized everything to make it nice and ready for texturing, then painted all of the textures in Substance Painter, created the materials in Blender, gave it some outlines, and finally just overlaid the paper texture on it to really finish it. This whole model took me about 25 hours or so over the course of a couple of weeks. With something like this, you shouldn't rush it. I always do a small bit, then come back to it later or even the next day, and this will allow you to see it from a fresh perspective. I may have gone a little bit overboard and also made the pen in 3D and created a physics simulation of it falling and being pushed away by one of the snakes, but that was just a fun thing that I thought would be cool. I also uploaded the modeled Sketchfab if you want to have a closer look at it. Anyway, if you want to create your own female characters, go and check out my female base mesh, the link's in the description. But I hope you enjoyed the video, and thanks for watching.